Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, could Big Brother in China be watching you through TikTok? Republicans and Democrats both grilling the CEO of the world's most popular online app, TikTok. Amid concerns, the Chinese government could use information from the app to spy on Americans. But the Chinese government has that data. How, how can you promise that, uh, that that will move into, uh, into the United States of America and be protected here. Parents' rights in schools and what books should be available for kids in libraries. Those were the big issues in congressional hearings Thursday. We'll bring you the story from Washington. Hundreds of congregations leaving the United Methodist Church over LGBTQ and sexual issues. It seems as if a lot of clergy feel as if they should be able to practice their sexuality in whatever way they desire, that the church should have no bearing on that. Um, and we just don't believe it. Now a new Methodist movement is growing. Many Jews fled Ukraine when the war began, but many were too sick or too old to leave. We'll look at how they're doing with the war in its second year and honoring the legacy of one of the first composers and publishers of gospel music. Those stories and more today on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. Let's begin this half hour in Washington where Congress the C grilled the CEO of TikTok Thursday. One of the major issues, growing concern, the app can be used to spy on Americans, not to mention the potential for user data being shared with the Chinese government. CBN Capitol Hill correspondent Mel Galka filed this report after yesterday's hearing. TikTok CEO didn't find many allies on Capitol Hill in his first high profile attempt to persuade lawmakers not to ban the app and try to convince them that TikTok is not working with communist China. Let me start by addressing a few misconceptions about ByteDance, of which we are a subsidiary. ByteDance is not owned or controlled by the Chinese government. CEO Xu Zichu appeared in front of a skeptical Congress as the push to ban the TikTok app has intensified over fears the platform is a national security threat. Parent company ByteDance has confirmed former employees track some U.S. journalists, an act the Justice Department is now investigating. Still, Chu testified the Chinese government never requested user data, nor would the company give that up. Chu maintains TikTok is committed to keeping American user data inside the U.S. while touting that 150 million Americans use the platform. Both Republicans and Democrats showed their skepticism over his belief communist China wouldn't wield influence over the company. You say with 100% certainty that ByteDance or the CCP cannot use your company or its divisions to heat content to promote pro-CCP messages for an act of aggression against Taiwan. We do not promote or remove content at the request yeah, of the, the question, Chinese government. The question, and is, we will replain, the question is, are you 100% certain that they cannot use your company to promote such messages? It is our commitment to this committee and all our users that we will keep this free from any manipulation by any okay. government. If you can't say 100% certain, I take that as a no. But the Chinese government has that data. What, how, how can you promise that uh, that, that will move into, uh, into the United States of America and be protected here? Uh, Congressman, I have seen no evidence that the Chinese government has access to that data. They have never asked us. We have not provided. Well, you know what? I, have I, asked find, that that, I find that actually preposterous. Representative Kat Kamek then showed a TikTok video that appeared to be a threat against the committee. I'd like to direct your attention to the screen for a short video, if you don't mind. This video has been up for 41 days. It is a direct threat to the chairwoman of this committee, the people in this room, and yet it still remains on the platform. And you expect us to believe that you are capable of maintaining the data security, privacy and security of 150 million Americans, where you can't even protect the people in this room? The video disappeared from the platform shortly after. We are in the middle of Operation Save TikTok. Chu's testimony comes as TikTok influencers, some with millions of followers, walk the halls of the Capitol, many lobbying that a ban would ruin their livelihoods. I have sold over 35,000 cards through um, my website, but 95% of those orders come from TikTok followers. I'm going to say that again. 95% of my orders come because of TikTok. The chair of the committee called for an outright ban on the app while a forced sale of TikTok to an American company has been proposed as an alternative. 
China announced on Thursday that they would firmly oppose that move and also issued a bit of a veiled threat, saying that a forced sale would seriously undermine the confidence of investors from other countries, including China, in investing in the United States. Matt Gelka, CBN News. Also in Washington, lawmakers taking the issue of parents' rights in the classroom. In two hearings on Capitol Hill, one dealing with free speech, including the books allowed in school libraries, the other on the Republicans' Parents' Bill of Rights Act. CBN's Jenna Browder brings us the story. A fiery day on Capitol Hill in hearings debating parents' rights in the classroom. Republicans say it's about increasing transparency. Democrats, though, say it's censorship and pits parents against teachers. Republicans taking action in response to angry parents speaking out at school board meetings over materials in public schools. Obviously, some Democrats today want to silence parents who disagree with their woke agenda to indoctrinate American children with controversial and inappropriate curricula. The GOP's Parents' Bill of Rights requires schools post curriculum and respect free speech at school board meetings. Republicans focused on a DOJ memo targeting parents for acting out at school board meetings. This is what domestic terror looks like. This is not a school board meeting. There is no hotline for any of these riots, and we are going to have a hotline that's going to report parents for caring about their children's education. The bill's most divisive point, a requirement that schools list books in libraries. Democrats accuse Republicans of wanting to censor history. This state mandated censorship does not protect students. Instead, these legislative efforts will likely harm students, teachers, and the quality of public education. We do not serve the interests of students when we shield them from the truth, as uncomfortable as the truth may be at times. Sarah Partial Perry with the Heritage Foundation says the movement is parent driven. The parents have found their voices and that COVID has given us a new perspective on exactly what our students, what our children are learning at the grassroots level, what they're being taught. And many of those concepts are not only divisive, we're seeing books now included in school libraries that are outright pornographic in violation of longstanding obscenity laws. I hope they're successful in banning a number of books. The question is, which are those books? Are those books, for example, uh, Gender Queer, a memoir, that book, or This Book is Gay? In that book, there are all sorts of depictions, depictions with body parts and male body, body parts. I can't even put on the screen the stuff that is in this book, Gender Queer, where there's two men uh, engaged in a sexual position, another uh, page where I can flip to where there's two men engaged in oral sex. Another uh, picture here in which there are uh, any number of uh, ridiculous uh, graphic pictures that are being put in front of our kids in schools. The House votes today on the Parents' Bill of Rights. If it passes, though, it faces an uphill battle in the Senate. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Turning down to the Middle East, American forces launched what they called precision airstrikes in Syria today after a strike by a suspected Iranian-made drone killed a U.S. contractor and wounded five American troops and another contractor. The U.S. strike targeting facilities used by groups affiliated with Iran's Revolutionary Guard reportedly killing at least four people. Coming up, churches making a brutal decision. Hundreds of them are leaving the United Methodist denomination. You're going to find out why and what comes next when we come back. Brutal, that is how one minister described his congregation's departure from the United Methodist Church. It's part of a growing trend. One of the largest Protestant denominations in America has lost nearly 2,000 congregations. Charlene Aaron recently traveled to Texas, where a number of churches are joining a new Methodist movement. More than 500 churches across Texas are no longer affiliated with the United Methodist denomination, many of them located here in the Houston area. While pastors admit the decision to leave has not been easy, they felt it necessary for moving forward. It's been brutal. That's the word, brutal. Um, it was not an easy decision. Pastor Bert Palmer of Kingwood Methodist Church has been part of this denomination for most of his life. It was the United Methodist Church in which I heard the call to ministry, was nurtured in the faith, 
That history made it all the more difficult when Kingwood members chose to leave the UMC over the denomination's adoption of an LGBTQ-friendly ideology. It seems as if a lot of clergy feel as if they should be able to practice their sexuality in whatever way they desire, that the church should have no bearing on that. Um, and we just don't believe it. Last November, the move to be more accepting of these lifestyles included the election of a second openly gay bishop. Pastors tell us this forced them to accelerate their exit from one of the nation's largest Protestant denominations. Looking at what I believe is going to be the future of the United Methodist Church, I didn't really see a place for me uh, in, in the United Methodist Church. Pastor Howard Hun says his embrace of Scripture helped him make the decision. What I believe Scripture very clearly teaches, that uh, human sexuality is, is a gift from God, reserved for a husband and wife, a man and a woman, uh, in a monogamous marriage. According to the denomination's General Council on Finance and Administration, more than 1,800 U.S. churches have left the denomination since 2019. More than 1,200 congregations have joined the new theologically conservative Global Methodist denomination, which launched last May. Reverend Keith Boyette is in charge of leading the group through this important transition. It was clear that the conflict in the United Methodist Church was not going to be resolved. That impacted the message of the church, the witness of the church. Uh, that witness became very confused. Confusion that churches, including some outside the U.S., seek to avoid. All of the Methodist churches in Bulgaria, all of the Methodist churches in Slovakia uh, voted to unanimously to withdraw. There are four annual conferences in Russia. They all voted to uh, begin the process of departure from the United Methodist Church, and their ultimate intention is to align with the Global Methodist Church. Boyette sees the recent decision surrounding human sexuality as just one of several troubling doctrinal issues in the UMC. We believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one uh, comes to the Father except through him, and that there is salvation only in the name of Jesus. The United Methodist Church likes to call itself a big tent, so it would permit other, other beliefs about Jesus and would permit its pastors to proclaim um, you know, other viewpoints of Jesus, that, that uh, he might not be the only way of salvation. Pastor Jason Smith of Katy, Texas, points to other viewpoints. Well, I sat there two years ago, or now two and a half, and watched as a young man came forward. He had been commissioned into the United Methodist Church. He was up for ordination. And this young man was held back from ordination for no other reason than he used he to describe his God, which is the way the scriptures describe God. And so that was not gender neutral. And therefore, he did not meet the standards of the United Methodist Church for ordination. And from that point on, I knew that we were on this slippery slope. A slippery slope that led Smith's church to vote on whether to depart the denomination. According to the UMC Book of Discipline, any decision to disaffiliate from the mainline denomination must be approved by a two-thirds or 66.7% majority vote of the professing members of the local church present at the church conference. The vote at Smith's church fell short, as only 60.7% of his congregation voted to leave. I was devastated. I, I, I was convinced, and so was the associate pastor. We were convinced this was going to pass. We just knew it. We sat there before we came and told the congregation and just in tears. What are we going to do? After a time of soul searching and prayer, Smith felt led to pastor the newly formed Resurrection Church, where more than 300 members, many former United Methodists, joined the very first service. I see a church here at Katy that just is on fire for Jesus. I see God moving in ways that I never thought possible until this past month. He's just getting started. Pastor Hun today. feels a revival taking place at his church, which has seen a 70% increase in attendance. We are experiencing uh, new life in a way that, uh, that we never have before in the, in the United Methodist movement in my lifetime. A movement Boyette sees spreading globally as the split over the UMC's progressive views continue.
I believe that we are on the cusp of a great spiritual awakening around the world. And I believe God has chosen to raise up the Global Methodist Church to be part of that for such a time as this. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Houston. Still ahead, when the war in Ukraine began, many Jews fled to Israel, but some were too weak and sick to escape. We're going to bring you a look from Ukraine at how they're doing now, right after this. When Russia invaded Ukraine, many Jews fled to Israel and other countries, but some of the sick and elderly could not leave. With the war in its second year, CBN News Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl returned to Ukraine to see how Jewish communities there are surviving. Billboards lining the streets of Ukraine send encouraging messages to its war-torn people. All together for victory, God will give strength to his people. Ukrainian National Guard, all Ukraine is with us. Here in Odessa, everything's quiet now, but life is not normal. There are military checkpoints along the highways, sirens sounding at night sometimes and during the day, keeping people in shelters. There are no lights on the streets at night and power cuts to homes and businesses. Now my husband is uh, on the war and uh, he's uh, trying to protect our motherland, and uh, he's far from our home. English teacher Anna Dorenko remains in Odessa with her two children. Many people uh, lost their work, and many people had to leave the country and uh, went abroad, especially women with children. Even my husband wanted me to uh, go somewhere with children, but I said that I can't do it without him. So Durenko puts her life on hold, waiting for her husband to return. Now we are waiting for the end of the war. We don't have plans. We have only dreams, and we are afraid of making plans. That's why we don't know what we will do after this. In the meantime, organizations like Tikva are helping Durenko and many others it provides food and medicine with support from the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, IFCJ. Chabad Rabbi Avraham Wolf and his community are also helping the Jewish community during this trying time. He says war has changed how they operate. We move from lessons and studies to saving lives and simply to allow people to survive, to pass through the war, to recover anew and to return to normal. Rabbi Wolf can now help meet those needs, handing out food boxes to 7,000 families a month. People lost their income. They lost all possibility to live in such a short time. If the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews wasn't providing food here, people would die one after the other. It's simply the minimum we can do for them. CBN News visited a distribution center as they provided food to Holocaust survivors. Those are the basics that keep them all month. Flour, sugar, macaroni, sardines, oil, everything that's possible. There are months when there are four boxes. There are months when there are two boxes, depending on the budget and the possibility. 187 Holocaust survivors remain in Odessa, including Elena Kuklova, whose father was Jewish. Dvornichka. The female janitor who lived in the basement of our building said to my mother, Luba, if you won't give me your room, I'll inform the occupation authorities that you have a daughter by a Jew. Elena's mother began hiding her at age three. They put me in a trunk. They drilled small holes there. I was an obedient child. When there was enough time, they hid me in the broom closet of a family with many children. The fear that Elena might be killed took a toll on the young mother. For the rest of her life, until her death, she had this fear. She became disabled. It couldn't work anymore. But I survived. Elena became an actress at 25 and devoted her artistic life to the Holocaust theme. I always used to tell my friends, I'm afraid of war more than anything else in the world. And here it is. My generation is framed, so to speak, with this black paint. We were born some a bit earlier, others a bit later into the war. And now we're departing this world with the war. Of course we live in fear, but we get so much help, they don't leave us. While there seems to be no end to the war in sight, Elena and others still hope to see peace again before they leave this world. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Odessa, Ukraine. 
And for more news from the Middle East, be sure to check out Jerusalem Dateline on the CBN News Channel. You can find it this evening at 8.30 Eastern. You can also see it on the CBN News app and watch it on YouTube. Coming up, honoring the legacy of a gospel music pioneer. We're going to have that story for you when we come back. Please stay with us. Gospel music rediscovered. For more than 20 years, the gospel music archives of Charles Henry Pace collected dust at the University of Pittsburgh. That is, until the school realized it was sitting on a treasure. The university's library stored more than 100 pieces of Pace's music that didn't exist anywhere else in the world. Charles Pace was one of the first composers and publishers of gospel music. Pace and his wife started the Pace Chorale Union and a music store that became a hub for traveling musicians. In 2021, the University of Pittsburgh started a project to improve accessibility to music, honoring the Pace family at an event, including a free concert showcasing Charles's work. The school also enlisted the help of Pace's daughter, Frances, who was eager to bring it to light again. I'll be very interested to see how true they stay to the music, what they do with it. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing songs I haven't heard in 40 years. Pace was one of the few people who knew how to fully print sheet music using negatives and metal plates mounted onto scrap wood, which was crucial to the expansion of gospel music in the United States. Time now for your Faithful Friday, and today I want to leave you with this thought as we wrap another work week together. Change is guaranteed no matter how much you like or dislike this moment. Savor the good, learn the lessons in the bad, and keep your heart open to change. With that word, I encourage you to make this a fabulous Friday, and be sure to have yourself a wonderful weekend and get some rest in the process, too. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our programs on the CBN News Channel. In fact, you can find them there at any time as well as online at CBNNews.com. We would love to know what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. And, of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here Monday. Goodbye. God bless.